Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless us with the time that you give us, that we would rightly understand how to use our days and our hours, that we would grow into your image now and all our days. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, if you're getting your outline there, uh, Bierman begins this chapter on leisure after an exhaustive discussion about work and what it is and how it fits into our lives and how it is really governed the way that we, we sort of see the world and relate to the world. Now we're talking about leisure, which we're going to uh, naturally understand as the flip side of work, leisure as the thing that you're doing when you're not working. And a major influence for, uh, for Bierman is not only Holy Scripture, but also another Christian who has thought a lot about this. And it's another theologian named Pieper. It's not the one that many Lutherans know very well. Uh, rather, that is the, the gentleman named Franz Pieper. Uh, he authored the famous Christian dogmatics series, which in his own time became the primary theological textbook that was taught in our seminaries and so on. So, uh, Joy, this is definitely, your dad knows Franz Pieper's Christian dogmatics. It's what I got, I was taught. It's really the standard dogmatics text and the way that we understand and kind of arrange our theology. But what was funny is that he was influenced by a different Pieper, not a German Lutheran dogmatician of his own tradition, but rather another guy named Joseph Pieper, who uh, more than just not being uh, a Lutheran dogmatician was a Roman Catholic Thomist philosopher. That is the kind of guy who took someone like Thomas Aquinas very seriously and formed a lot of his thoughts around, uh, around that pattern. But much of what he's going to arrive at, that is Joseph Pieper, is gonna be useful for Christians of any stripe. It was certainly useful for Biermann, and we're very glad that he distilled those thoughts for us in this, in this study. So as we begin to talk about leisure, I just want to, rather than tell you what I think you think about it, okay, what is leisure? Just in your own words, don't worry about some sort of a textbook definition. It's a noun. All right, we'll start there. What, what is it, though? People are worried about having wrong answers. Audrey, yeah. I think it's anything that you just do because you want to and not because you have to. Or, you know, maybe you just rest, or maybe you just do something you like. Mm -hmm. Just because it makes you happy. Okay, so I, I like that you tied in a sense of fulfillment and a joy to it. So I'm hearing, yeah, something that's not required of you, but something that you want to do. Nobody's demanding that. Okay. Paul. It's reveling in God's creation. Yeah, I, I front loaded this. <laughs> I should have said Ron answers only, but fear not, Paul didn't give away the whole Bible study. Uh, nevertheless, I should have called in you last, right? You could have been my feed section. What, what else? I mean, and discount the last nine seconds, strike it from the record. How have you thought about leisure in your life? Who's ever used the phrase, I, in my leisure time, I usually, and then they do something. That something tells me kind of what you think about it. It's probably a lot like the way I have, uh, for the course of my life, thought about it. So English just dictionaries will describe it as free time when you're not going about your other duties. And it's, uh, it's true that the absence of that obligation, the absence of that uh, call to work in your life is part of leisure. It does belong to it, but that's not nearly all of it. Leisure, uh, as it was identified, because we didn't just kind of come up with the idea our, ourselves, leisure as it was identified by the Greeks was called something different. It was called skole. And then later in Latin that became scola. Anybody know, uh, hearing what the root is here? School. Yeah, things like school, scholar. Yeah, exactly right. Paul. I mean, this is where the origin of liberal arts comes from, is because liberal arts are things that a free man, a man who is unoccupied with work, can do. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna arrive at that, and and that's kind of a an unfortunate consequence 
of history, at least history as it is kind of governed in some ways by the fall into sin. Uh, but I'll get it. I don't want to get ahead of myself too much. So for them, leisure wasn't about relaxing or taking a vacation. Uh, in fact, the word vacation uh, means something else. You might not hear it, but vaco as in vacuous or vacuum, some, empty. Okay? Empty, void. And I don't know, I just go back to Genesis and I see that when God finds things that are empty and void, he likes, he likes to arrange them and order them and do something wonderful with them. So instead, leisure is about being gifted with the time that's necessary to be freed from doing hard work, yeah? And being instead able to turn your attention about things that matter and then celebrating those things. So things like what? Things like the purpose of life, the meaning of our humanity, our place in creation. Very big ideas that uh, if we would stop convincing ourselves that these are sort of abstractions or just ideas and not things that are actually there for us to live out and embrace and that are available to us, even in tangible ways, uh, then we might begin to sort of chip away at philosophy as just kind of a thought enterprise and instead something that we engage in. But it was, to some degree, about deep thinking and wondering and delighting the kind that is traditionally done, in, at least in our thinking, by philosophers, a word which by itself just means those who love wisdom. It meant being aware of and uh, appreciating the truths of the world, and it meant living life to the fullness of your humanity, not merely surviving, not merely indulging your passions, but actually being and becoming what God created you to be. Of course, as Paul alluded to, not everybody, especially not everyone throughout time, has had the opportunity for that, uh, which is why that philosophy is imagined to be what? What do you think of when I say, oh, this person's a philosopher? Universities, ivory tower, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's funny. Ivory tower, tower is a certain kind of scholarship. I mostly imagine philosophers in kind of moldy, wood-paneled rooms, and they're always wearing tweeds, <laughs> and their hair is disheveled. And I don't know if that's just because I've actually met philosophers <laughs> or if it's because I have some image of my head of an ideal life. I don't know. But uh, we find that because this is something that is given to us as people, as God's people especially, that it's a special kind of poverty when people who are only engaged in hard work, that it, what... Uh, what is often referred to as the life of total work. They, they tend to be below uh, the poverty line in terms of economics, but there's another kind of poverty that comes without having the ability and the free, I shouldn't say ability, but the free time, the leisure time to actually pursue things that matter. So to speak to last week's question about technology, uh, Pieper was appalled. Uh, he's writing around the... Um, uh, early 20th century, he's appalled that everyday people, uh, when they are presented with a new world, a world that's opening up and uh, technology is advancing, and not entirely, but the days of just criminally difficult, abusive, and uh, just terrible hard labor are kind of going away. He was amazed and shocked and terrified that people when they would be presented with the opportunity for more leisure, were choosing to do more and more work. Uh, we, we have this sort of idea that if everything was done for us, uh, that we would just relax and we would take it. It's kind of like the, the Jetsons idea, right? The, where the robots are taking everything, care of everything in the Jetsons and Oh my gosh, I don't even want to go off on this tangent. There's robots everywhere, but George Jetson goes and makes cogs for Mr. Cogswell. 
this is a dystopian vision that I can't even handle right now. I need, to, I, need to, I need to take some time on my commute home and think about the theological implications of the Jetsons and, uh, and the abuse of leisure. But anyway, that's for a different study. I'll report back to you. Now, today, right where we are, generally, people don't forsake work for true leisure. But when we are free of our work for a time, and it's okay if you call it a vacation, that's what the world calls it. They call it vacation, they call it time off. When we're freed from that, for however long, are we generally embracing uh, the more high ideal of leisure, or are we doing something else? What are we doing? Or I could you say, what did you do on your summer vacation? Yeah. It, it makes me think of how um, the book club read A Gentleman in Moscow, and it talks about a man of leisure. And I had never put it together that when they say a man of leisure, they mean a man who has time to think of like the higher things, mm -hmm. not someone who has time to just fritter away. Yeah. And so many people who were rich enough to, quote, be a man of leisure, they did fritter away with gambling and yeah. parties and things. And today, when we have leisure, we do the same things. Sometimes we fritter it away. But today, instead of, you know, it's been shown that, like, young people do less of, like, drinking or having sex outside of marriage because they're just, you know, they're on their screens. <laughs> but that's still frittering it away. Yeah. Um, so it's when, it, when we were saying... We're afraid of it. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to think about that. I'm just going to fill my attention. Isn't it amazing that how we can kind of mess up good things with... I, in ways that we wouldn't have imagined. So for years, the church would have been saying things like, hey, you should really uh, you know, limit sexual uh, relations to your marriage. And then, and then we see Gen Z come up. We're like, not like that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, it. That's, that's not it, Paul. Yeah. Well, this, this, this is the stuff to think about leisure. Uh, and there's something about the concept of it is that leisure is actually work. The van is designed to work. We feel like, I feel this when I take a day off, I feel like I don't know what to do with myself. So I actually want to go do something, uh, go do something and figure out something, some way to structure our time. So meaningful use of leisure is not just kind of sitting there pondering your navel or doing anything along those lines. It is enjoying what God has given you, whether that be going and doing work or something like that, or doing something else that you enjoy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's deceptive to kind of divide work and leisure at some level, yeah. because both matter, both are important, both have certain purposes, both are things that you can enjoy. But the thing is, is that they, they are both work at the end of the day, because you are using your hands, using what God designed you to do to do something. Yeah. We'll get to, yeah. towards earning a paycheck or doing something else to praise the Lord. Sure, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, the many ways that leisure or a life of leisure is manifested. And thankfully, it's not uh, just going and locking yourself in my idea of the philosopher's study and you know smoking a pipe and sitting there and just thinking thoughts to yourself. It's not going to be like that. Uh, yeah, that's a really sterile, static kind of thing. Joy? I have to say, I'm, I'm really struggling with this concept of leisure right now yeah. because I feel like, I mean, you know, looking back in the last week, the things that I might consider leisure activities were for a purpose. Like, the time I spent watching Dancing with the Stars with my eight-year-old was, like, specifically because she needed mom time. Like, yep. the time we spent, you know, having people over for dinner was specifically because, well, we need to get to know these people better, right? Yeah. Like, there was a purpose for that. Um, later this afternoon, when I get home and finally take a nap, like that's going to be so that I can like, better function for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. like, these leisure, leisure-looking activities also have a functional work-based purpose in some ways. So I'm, I'm struggling with yeah. like, what is leisure and do I have it? Yeah, I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I, I'm not going to try to answer that all at once. But I, I think the rest of our discussion is going to get us there. Though I think what's funny is I, as I think, um, just cognitively about when you say that, you know, when you go home today and you're going to take a nap, you're just thinking about the fact that you're going to lay down and rest and kind of tune out for a little bit, right? And and rest and, and in some way recharge also for the rest of the day, right? But think about this. What is your mind doing when you're when you're asleep? Your mind is processing, repairing, 
integrating everything that happens. So actually, when you are sleeping this afternoon, and I hope you get a good nap, you are going to be uh, absorbing and sorting through this morning's worship, right? the fellowship hour, the names of the people that you met that God put into your lives, this study, and all that. So uh, despite your best effort, you actually will be engaged in leisure uh, when you are sleeping. Yeah, Paul. Well, even more expansive than that, you end up with, when you're in leisure, you end up serving your neighbor as well because, because a lot of times you're doing leisure stuff, you are inviting somebody else's work. So in case like art, so if you enjoy playing video games, going to see a movie, going to watch television, you're inviting somebody else's work, doing good service to them, paying them something for them so they can live their life and then also enjoying their unveiling of what God's work is in terms of what they have seen and what how yeah. they go. Similarly, they watch football this afternoon, which is what I'm going to do. You're watching this. You're enjoying watching the sport of men doing violence against each other, but also enjoying, <laughs> the, enjoying the sport of the actual contest and everything going on, and enjoying the, the social context broader than that. So, yeah. the, the, the leisure has a very la large sort of thing that is not just you, but it's also everybody around you. The important packs everybody. I, I I like the idea about. Because I think the concept of leisure as it relates to Sabbath necessarily involves harmony because Sabbath is the right relationship and right ordering of yourself with God and also with his creation. So your horizontal dimension that you're bringing out is, I think, really appropriate, especially when you start talking about things like aesthetics and art that we're going to get to today. Bierman would not follow you to afternoon football. Uh, <laughs> I, to believe me, I want to make a case for you, all right? And maybe, maybe we can find it. We, we don't have to just accept everything in his book uh, straight up. But I'm, I'm, <laughs> say, I'm saying, like, there's, there's a little bit of tension there. Audrey, than gladness, yeah. Uh, I was wondering how it relates to, like, Mary and Martha, because you were talking about having people over. And to me, it seems like that's a combination of work, because you're, like, preparing like Martha, but then also you're just enjoying their presence and you're kind of resting while they're there, yeah. you know, and talking and chatting, and that seems more like Mary, and that seems more Sabbath-ish. Yeah, so the, the, the offense there is not that work was being done, but that when Jesus, who is our Sabbath rest, is there in our immediate presence to gift and to teach and to love, that the idea of being at work instead of in kind of in receive mode that was something that was contrary to Sabbath and contrary to leisure. And that's why it invited something of a, of a correction. Yeah, gladness. Yes, so I, I'm kind of like trying to figure it out in terms of like when you're explaining the brain and the brain is processing all of this, and that's kind of like taking a leisure. Is it easy to take a leisure every day? Because when you see six, six to seven hours a day, so, and when you're resting, your brain is still processing by yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of, a few weeks ago we discussed the fact that our bodies are designed, one, to work, but they are not, in this world, designed for total work, but rather uh, we have built into us natural sleep cycles, circadian rhythms, and this is, a norm, this is just a normal thing, this is how we are made. So in the same way that you are made for work, you are also made for rest. You are also made for Sabbath, and you are also made for leisure. Now, the, the, it was a bit of a stretch, but I think it was defensible to talk about leisure as that time that uh, you spend even in unconscious reflection as you sleep. But I think the reason it's defensible is because that also belongs to Sabbath. That is actual rest. And when you, especially when you have something fruitful like the word of god to reflect on even if unconsciously and process and integrate into your life and to wake up refreshed with that uh having been nurtured and grown in you yeah that's that's leisure it doesn't have to feel like work it doesn't have to feel like contemplation uh and we're going to get a little bit uh more into into the 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 total body picture of leisure as we proceed I, I like that we're thinking critically about this. Um, and though I, I do notice that there's, a, I feel a tinge of the law in the air. 
because what I'm hearing already a little bit from, from Paul's talk about football this afternoon to Dancing with the Stars is there is some sense of accusation that you're not using every second of your time rightly. And so rather than me just go ahead and tell you that, you know, sitting down and watching football for three hours is totally what God means by Sabbath, eh, right? Or that dancing with the stars partakes of it in the same way. Hold the tension for a minute and just kind of let, let, it, let, let things be at a low simmer. Uh, when we talk about the uh, kind of anti-leisure and what it is that we're doing when we're not working or when we take a vacation, really the, the task uh, that has been left behind was our, our work, and that's fine. But what we notice most people do is they just amuse themselves. Right? It's just entertainment. And uh, entertainment that gives you your little dopamine hit or whatever it is. And that's not leisure. It's the triumph of what Reef called the psychological man and the, and the age of the therapeutic. Uh, when we come to, we're in part three in your outline right now, uh, what Bierman calls the pinnacle of leisure. Leisure actually does demand a spiritual component if uh, you're going to be rightly related to God's creation and to God himself. So one thing you might begin to ask about your activities that are not obviously meeting the high ideals of leisure that Bierman sets forth here, uh, what, you, what you might start to do is think about, well, in the future when I engage in these, uh, how can they be rightly ordered? Uh, how can this be rightly understood as leisure? And how does the way I approach it affect that? Uh, because kind of like a dad who comes home after a long day of work uh, to, a, to, a, to a household, he's got a decision to make, right? When he opens the door, he could open his door to, I don't know what you're, what it's like when you get home, right? It could be crazy and noisy and it could be a mess and some things are falling apart or maybe not that day or he could go through the other door and uh, he's got a bustling house of gifts from God who love him and are excited to see him and want his attention because they love him and they just want him to love them back those are two different doors that go into the same living room right so in the same way uh, I'm saying that our approach to things like football and the and the way we are the way we are understanding it and its place in our lives has something to do, I think, with whether or not it can fit into the category of leisure. Yeah. I was thinking about how Joy said she, you know, she watched Dancing with the Stars because eight-year-old needs mommy time. You guys could have done the same thing, but with different attitudes, and I think it would change whether it was leisure or not because. Mm -hmm. If you're watching Dancing with the Stars and then your eight-year-old decided she really wanted to talk to you about something and it interrupted the show, I'm sure you would have just talked with her, right? And forgotten the show. Yep. Now, if she starts talking and you're like, what, what, I need to see the end. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, you kind of change what the whole purpose was yeah. to doing it. Like, you know, if you hang out with your spouse, but like, is the point to be with them? I mean, because often you just, you need some time when you're not doing anything yeah. at the same time, in the same room. And like, is the point to be with them or is the point to do whatever it is, to get to that restaurant or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, take that walk, get, achieve the, the distance you set or whatever. It, I don't know. Yeah. And, and again, you're not always thinking about that in the moment. You're, always, you're not always conscious of everything. Uh, oftentimes I'm out on a run and I never run with headphones, not just because of traffic, but because I, I, I want to feel and hear my breath. I, I want the heaviness and the weight of it uh, to be something that's part of my experience. And sometimes when I'm running, not all the time and certainly not every second, you can only think about it for so long. Uh, I'm thinking, wow, God 
makes our bodies to do pretty cool things. It's kind of ridiculous that I could uh, that I could run like this for an extended period of time. And if I was Chris Musk, Chris Muskoff, I'd be thinking about it a lot more <laughs> because you can run a lot farther and a lot longer and a lot faster. So you have a lot more to think about. It's just the same thing. Though. I'm, I'm just, run than I'm I just do. surprised that my heart continues to beat. You know, it's like kind of amazing. You know, I guess at this point, it's like I'm still going. Whatever it is, whether it's 2K, 5K, 7K, 42K. Yeah. You're like, no, oh, still going. It's kind of, kind of amazing. And then when I cool down, my heart is still beating. And yeah. I'm quite thankful for that in a very sort of fundamental way. When you're doing it, as opposed to like thinking about it or having being productive with getting in 12 podcasts that are 1.5 speed while you're... Yeah. <laughs> that's that's just kind of a... That's just another version of trying to cram everything into your garage, just trying to cram everything into your mind with every spare second. Um, sometimes, yeah, on my commute, sometimes I'm listening to a podcast, and sometimes I, I just want to look at the world going by outside the train window and I think that's cool the seasons are cool God did a wonderful thing with that I wonder what it was like you know 150 years before this train went in I wonder what this countryside looked like you know have we has this been good has this been bad was this inevitable what we did you know uh, and I think that that is leisure that's part of leisure uh the peak of leisure, and we're going to kind of go, not downhill, but we're going to go around the hill uh, when we talk about the pinnacle or the peak of leisure, because it demands a spiritual component, ultimately, if we're going to be rightly ordered with God in this creation, the highest and purest expression of leisure is going to be worship of God. Okay. And so it doesn't belong to philosophers, that is the life of leisure, it belongs to the church exclusively. Leisure belongs to the church. The essence of leisure is captured by the Christian worship of God. So, uh, and we can consider, just for a moment, a couple of examples, how that piety is captured in the Bible. So, first one is, for example, at Mount Sinai, when the elders of Israel, they're there and they delight in the presence of God, and they, they feast in his presence. Uh, or when the Psalms, they overflow with God's praise, and David cites the contemplation of God. And the end of his creation is part of worship. That's going on in Psalms 8 and 9 and 84 and 139. Um, or Isaiah, who says, Your name, even your memory, is the desire of our souls. At night my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. Um, and I think that's, that's something going on. Because you are baptized, because you are temples of the Holy Spirit, uh, with redeemed, not just souls, but with redeemed bodies, uh, your sleep is in some way different from the sleep of unbelievers. Joy's sleep, this afternoon or tonight, actually partakes of what Isaiah says. He's not just talking about himself. When he says that my soul longs for you, indeed my spirit within me seeks you diligently. That the processing of the word of God and the, and the life that he's given you, when you sleep, is part of leisure but you are partaking of it in a way that's only available uh, to Christians. Yeah, Audrey. Um, I'm a little behind in the treasury of daily prayer, but recently there was a passage that talked about how you know, the Israelites were exiled to Babylon, and God says, and so I'm going to make up for all the Sabbaths that you didn't take. There'll be the 70 years, and the land is going to get those Sabbaths. I'm going to make sure yeah. that those Sabbaths yeah. that you skipped mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me wonder, like, how does God make you take a Sabbath and a rest and to think about him? And uh, it seems like suffering is a big part of that. <laughs> like, they, they went into exile. And I don't know. I feel like this year with my health struggles, it's almost like God saying... And you are going to have a Sabbath rest now, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, like I that. that too, and I was so struck by that, and I couldn't tell. And you know, it's a good thing we have our Bibles come with Pastor. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure if this meant 
God was giving the land a Sabbath from the people of Israel. But until you said this, I'm wondering if they were also getting a Sabbath in some ways, an enforced Sabbath in Babylon. Because, you know, the whole promised land notion was it's a place where you can it's a place yes. of rest. Yeah. And they had done nothing but sort of ruined the land with idolatry and probably poor farming practices. And, and so God said, you know, we're going to take a break. The, the, great, the greatest Sabbath rest is going to be the one that God gives, and that's manifested in uh, the, the deliverance of his people and then all the kind of the consequences of that too, how there's a connection between the people and the world that he's given us, right? So Sabbath extends to uh, our relationship, not just with God and even with other people, but you could say it, it extends to our relationship with the world itself that God also has redeemed and understanding it and working in concert with it. Uh, I think this partakes a little bit of in week one when we talked about how Sabbath is written already into creation in a natural law sort of way that the land, for example, needs to be rested, right? Minerals need to recharge uh, in, in the soil and so on. That's not scientific talk. I'm not trying to, I'm not a, I'm not a U of I agriculture guy, um, but I know some, okay? So uh, back to the idea that worship is the chief form of this. I also think uh, you got to give credit where credit's due. The Westminster Short Catechism which I was exposed to when our kids were in a, in a Christian school in Middleborough. Uh, it's a, a reform school. And the first question, the first day in their chapel service is from the Westminster Short Catechism. Uh, the first question, what is the chief end of man? I mean, you would think if, 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 uh, if the nutty professor is going to lock himself in his wood panel study with the mustiness and his pipe, and just contemplate any question for three weeks and come out covered with moss. It's that, what is the chief end of man? I love how they don't go on some long, elaborate, striding cascade of words and proofs. They say, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I mean, that's a short catechism right there. And, uh, but they, they really did put their finger on the pulse of not only man's chief end, but also of, of leisure. So leisure is part of worship, and it's the basis of culture, right? Root word to culture, cult, worship. Okay? And when we think about culture, uh, at least in our, in our modern sense, and because when people talk about culture, who honestly is talking about worship? Nobody, right? Hardly, hardly ever. Okay? Uh, this takes us to point four, in your outline about celebrating the festival. One way, uh, if, if you've traveled abroad and you find yourself on some sort of a parade and, uh, and you're like, wow, this is, this is amazing. We don't have this where I'm from. This is a remarkable part of the culture. And that's the way that the people will describe it. Well, this is our culture. This is what we do. And they're talking about their festivals. They're talking about uh, their sports, they're talking about their food and their language. Uh, their culture is a, is a wide encompassing thing. Uh, what makes the argument for the central significance of leisure uh, compelling is the fact of the festival. Okay, uh, it's a word that means a lot of things to lots of different folks. When I talk about a, when I say festival, what what are you thinking of? We're having, we're having a festival. What are you talking? Probably depends who we is and who's talking. It's a party of some sort. It's a, it's a party of some sort. It's a celebration of some kind. And there's lots of different types. There's uh, ones that uh, mark events in history. Right? Uh, I, I, when I lived in DC, I always looked forward to the Cherry, Cherry Blossom Festival. That's just a great time of year. Um, today, today's a festival in the church, right? The Feast of St. Michael and All Angels. That's a historic feast. That's part of church culture. What's another festival that I can't believe we haven't done yet? I just need, here's, if, if you get anything more out of this Bible study today, just know this, it doesn't have to be you. But I need somebody 
to help us truly partake in, in culture and in festival and in right leisure and right Sabbath by organizing Oktoberfest. Okay, Oktoberfest is an absolute festival and it is, taught, it is part of what uh, we're talking about when we talk about leisure. The true beauty and the power of leisure comes into focus when we do not. Okay, this is going to seem antithetical, so I'm going to repeat it. We're doing our best work and thinking and appreciation of leisure when we do not make a sharp distinction between a secular festival and a sacred festival. That is when we don't draw a super sharp line between Oktoberfest and the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels. We'd be doing our best when we come out of second service, okay, afternoon, and we've just had the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, and we have an Oktoberfest warm-up in the courtyard, and then we go and celebrate it with, with the rest of Boston. Though I have not found a good Oktoberfest in Boston, which means it's not as full of culture as everybody thinks. Okay, That's actually a really rightly ordered sense of and experience of leisure. And so maybe you, your, your initial occupations, uh, preoccupations with this concept of leisure, I hope are beginning to kind of wash away a little bit. Leisure is not something that only happens in your head or in your heart, or in reading a book, a leisure is about the whole person, all of you, living in, and man, the lights got me, gone. okay, at 1015, living in and delighting in a right relationship with God and his creation. So if the idea of Oktoberfest seems just a little bit too much, uh, an even better picture of leisure as a one-two punch is coming out of the single worship service in the summer and going right to Jell-O Sunday. Right, or uh, the color orange, or all our all our all our summer themes for the fellowship hour. That's actually right leisure because you have the pinnacle of leisure in holy worship that has restored you to reconciled you with God and your fellow man, and then going and just enjoying life together. That's what the fellowship hour is. Uh, nobody. It might happen in some churches somewhere, but I don't think it's happening here. Nobody's trying to close a business deal at Jello, on Jello Sunday. Okay, If you are, come see me, because that's not what it's for. Okay, It's a community coming together for an hour or a few days of life out of the ordinary with no other objective than to celebrate their lives together. Okay, so you might think about Christmas tide, or uh, I was walking on the north end, which uh, you just visited yesterday, and this was, I forget if it was a Saturday or Sunday, it was the Feast of St. Mary this year, and the north end, uh, heavily Catholic, and it was, the Feast of St. Mary was a big deal this year because it fell on a Sunday, and so, I mean, the north end of it was absolutely bonkers. And they had a huge Marian procession and a carnival atmosphere and all the cannolis and all that stuff. That was culture. That was leisure. Now, could people have approached it and had a wrong relationship with that and ruined a good thing? Yeah, they, they could have. And I saw some people doing that. Okay, but uh, let's let's not, you know, throw throw everything out all at once. Um, culture, leisure, that intersection used to happen a lot more uh, for us. For example, at the end of the harvest, feast days, <coughs> commemorations of historic events, uh, and I think even civically, we understand this in part when, uh, for example, consider a national holiday. That, that is given to us that marks an event like what? How about Independence, uh, Day. Independence Day? right? Uh, I think too of something like um, Memorial Day. There's a lot to think about on both of those days, on Independence Day, on Memorial Day, and we mostly turn it into an opportunity for amusement. Okay? Uh, or, or fireworks or whatever 
And again, the, the idea of the festival shows us that there is part of that that's definitely in line with leisure and with a, a, a right living of our lives. But it shouldn't be absent of uh, our, our experience of the day and reflection on it. So civically, leisure on the 4th of July and on Veterans Day would be thinking about the fact that we are a sovereign nation. And then on Memorial Day, uh, a Christian can also add greater love has no man than this than that he laid down his life for his friends. Uh, those are worthy reflections on those days uh, that shouldn't ruin the day or cast a cloud over it, but be cause for and part of the festivals that accompany it, or even part of the rest, just depending on how you spend your, your 4th of July or your, or your Memorial Day. Um, another good picture of it, especially of where we are in New England, think to the 1621 harvest celebration with the, the pilgrims and the Wampanoag. What was that Thanksgiving like? We have written records of what the day was. It was prayers and praise to God uh, for his providence and uh, for bringing them safely to a new land. It was worship and feasting. It was dancing and it was prayers. It was games. And those things were shared even with people who were not believers in Christ. So uh, a right understanding of uh, and just marking a significant occasion that we all recognize has been significant for a long time and will continue to be uh, was was shared with another people. So um, the church really is the one that ought to be shaping culture and shape and uh, and you know politics and all that stuff should be downstream of it. So festivals uh, don't need to be and in fact should not be sanitized spiritual affairs of intellect and emotion. They're bodily and physical. So this might even uh, affect the way that you hear, if you're going to the 11 o'clock service, there's the, the cantata. And it's, it's 12 minutes of the 11 o'clock service. It's one sixth of the, of the worship service up, up there today. That's a lot. And I recognize it's a lot. And Cantor recognizes it's a lot. That's why he's trimmed it down from 33 minutes. Okay? He's, he's cut down all of, the, all of the repetitive things. He's really, really, really trimmed this thing down to 12 minutes. Which, I mean, for somebody with the understanding and appreciation of sacred music, has to be really difficult emotionally. Okay? But he did it. Anyway, when you're up there at that 11 o'clock service, um, recognize that your whole body is in that moment participating in leisure. It's not just your mind reflecting on uh, the formation of these words, but song, right? That's creation. And your ears are involved. And your imagination. Uh, and all of these things are coming together in the act of worship and contemplation of God and his gifts. And then again, you know, you go out to fellowship hour. So what's happening upstairs is, is absolute leisure, but it shouldn't again be this sanitized thing. That's why I, I'm never upset or annoyed when in the middle of a cantata, a kid starts screaming. Doesn't bother me a bit. Okay. So, um, we don't have time to give the long quote that I want to do. Anyway, all that, all that to say that we can show our neighbors him who is their life, and also we can show them how to live. The Christian life, even and the life of leisure as part of that, shouldn't be some boring, antiseptic, um, prudish sort of thing, uh, but rather our not only our worship, but our celebrations and our festivals uh, the way we do that, I mean, we should be partying better than anybody. Okay. So, uh, instead, uh, what we're often drawn to and pulled to, along with the world, and this is, I mean, everybody likes a party, and nobody likes laziness or sloth, 
and yet we find that this is the, one of the things that we're, we're drawn to. Um, the idea of uh, akadia, sloth, one of the seven deadly sins. You've heard of this, Joy, sorry. Oh, sorry, we were, sorry. finish that thought because we were going to... Oh, no, it's long. Ask a question. To no, ask a question. question. We're over here kind of struggling with something a little bit. Yeah. We were just talking about sort of the stress that comes along with trying to yeah. Like preparing for a festival, you know, trying to pull things off. Like my friend had a party yesterday. And she made like a hundred pumpkin pies. You know, how did she do it? She she did it really amazingly well. But yep. it was, I'm sure, stressful during the day trying to pull this off. You know, and make sure that everything worked out okay. Yeah. Or We're, like the Muscoff Easter piece, which yeah. like seems to be like a true like festival. Absolutely. Right? We go from. We go from Easter morning, like to incredible feasting at their house, and it's just so much work. Like <laughs> that's like the pinnacle of leisure, right? You're combining the celebration of Christ's resurrection with all its amazing. How do you think I feel? Friends and stuff. Like every week, right? Right. right? right. Like, <laughs> I'm just, we're struggling over here. Like it's just so much exhausting work, but it's still celebration. Yeah. But in my mind, that just doesn't drive. Sure? Yeah. So, Beerman talks about this, and so um, I don't have time enough to kind of give a block out quote, but we do live with the reality that leisure does involve what absolutely feels like work, right? Uh, like sending out invitations, like planning for music and preparing the food and blowing up the you know, your, the, the, bounce, the bounce house in the backyard, right? So one way we deal with that is we ask, well, why, why are we doing this? Because uh, you talked about something you don't have to do, okay? You don't have to do it. You don't have to send out the invitation. You don't have to have a party. You don't have to put up the bounce house or make all the wonderful food. So why are you? You don't have to. You're doing it because you, or at least part of you, wants to. And uh, you recognize that it's actually a good thing, that it's right, uh, and that it's even salutary, as in not just good, but good for you. Uh, it's probably the reason why, when I run, that I run. It's, not, it, it's work, and I don't always look forward to it. But when I'm doing it, like, I know this is good for me. And it's, in so, at least insofar as I'm uh, contemplating it, there's leisure in that. So the work that goes into leisure activities and the planning of a festival or the planning of a worship service, uh, it's, that's not really anti-leisure. It just means that you're doing uh, work for the sake of uh, something that is worth it and something that is good and laudable and beautiful. Um, you're kind of doing it for the same. We're going to talk about aesthetics in a bit. Actually, I think we're going to have to punt a lot till ne to next week, and that's okay. There's, th there's just not enough time. Um, but you're, you're living within that tension knowing that this is a worthy activity. Because there's a million things that you could do with your time that you don't do. Right? And it's because they're not worth it to you. Okay? Uh, Gladys. Oh, I was just going to say, like, the leisure happens afterwards, not during, like, after the event, so it's like, you know, you're resting, and then you're going to the next day, and then you plan. Kind of like, I think of it, like, how God created the world. He spent six days, and then rested the seven. So it's, it always feels like, after. Speaking from someone who just plan away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, it can also be the, the process itself, too, right? So I think about in our house, you know, we have our oldest daughter, Lucia. Santa Lucia Day is a big day for us where we're cooking uh, the, the Lucia Cotter and making saffron buns with mom. I mean, we're not only enjoying that when they come out of the oven. Right? Uh, kind of like a little bit like the Dancing with the Stars thing uh, with, with your daughter was it's the time together is part of the leisure. And it's not something that you have to be actively thinking about for it to still be worthwhile, right? Or for it to still be worth the effort, yeah. yeah. Well, that's how it kind of works 
thinking about how we help each other. You know, like if you're feeling overly stressed, maybe ask for help. I mean, uh, you know, from God, from your neighbor. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that's... It shouldn't be such a burden on one person when everybody enjoys it. That's, you know, for... It, yeah, it ought to be something that we uh, that we work on together and we plan together. And now we got, I think, uh, a lot about. This is giving me new perspective in some way on one of the Garrison Keeler books that I that I enjoyed that centers around a, a festival and all the the disputes and the work and the planning that went into it and the lack of appreciation and uh, a little bit of a focus on some of the wrong things. Um, all that to say, though, is that our festivals and our culture are worth the expense of our time. They're uh, worth the things that we invest in them. Uh, and we know that there's something special to marking the day. I mean, I delight in it. And in the way I think that Chris and Ann delight in some of the work that goes into uh, their Easter party. When, when it's Christmas time in my house, yeah. I mean, is that a stressful time in a way in the church? Yeah, because I am really worried about delivering for Christmas. Okay, pastors just worry about it and they should worry about it. But I'm also thinking as soon as I get in that car and I'm on my way home, I, I've done some planning and I've gone to some great expense. And that Wellington is, is my work and my leisure and, uh, and my, <laughs> my focus when I get home. I mean... I'm doing that because it's just a wonderful, beautiful thing to create. And not just to do it and it tastes good, but to see the kids' faces when you, when you cut into them and you show them this thing that should, that should not exist in nature. Yeah. Right? Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And as they grow, they'll all involve them in it and stuff like that. Uh, in some way, Christmas, Christmas time, Christmas tide is a is a perfect example about what leisure is flowing from right worship of God pinnacle of leisure to everything that comes in the wake of that right? to uh, that's why I love the 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 study that we do here every year when we talk about uh, Christian traditions or, or sorry our Christmas traditions and now and, and maybe that's fun because we always have new new people so hold on don't go anywhere for the holidays just come here for the holidays because uh, what's fun is was we experience people, other people's cultures and what they grew up doing, some things bizarre, some things routine, uh, we get a wonderful picture of who they are and uh, how their faith has intersected their life and how they have chosen to use their, their leisure time. And it's remarkable and it's fun. And I hope you bring your stories uh, to that. And... I, I used to think there's nothing that'll top the carp in the bathtub that gets released into the river when they're out on a walk, but that day's coming. <laughs> Something's going to beat that. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't want to try. Yeah. You can just think about it and wonder, right? <laughs> um, I, I got to talk about uh, Acadia and aesthetics that is art and so on. There's just, there's just not enough time. Instead, maybe more questions. I'm really glad that we spent a little bit more time in discussion last couple of weeks felt like pure lecture as I was racing through. One quote from Pieper that comes to mind, I think it's from Nature is the Basis of Culture. He says something, or no, it's the uh, In Tune with the World, mm -hmm. that book. He says something like, the problem is not organizing the party, it's finding people who can actually celebrate it. And so I think to the, the point of like, oh, there's so much work to like do these things or plan yeah. for an entire liturgical season or you know, whatever. It's when you know that there are people who are celebrating it in the right way, as it is. It yeah. starts. It all starts with proper recognition, of worship as the basis of everything. Then the rest of it is kind of it falls into place. But when it starts from we have in a linear fashion, like we gotta do all this stuff to get to that point, then it it's like really mm -hmm. kind of kind of tough. And I think you made the point that. Many, many hands make light work in a way that, yeah. that a festival is by nature a communal thing. And yeah. people contribute to it in a way that, you know, you're not the only one doing something. Oh, yeah. You've got a, another pastor, you've got a cantor, you've got a whole congregation, you've got 
all these people contributing to the event. The, the Absolutely. Event. And, and I think if you look back and you say, okay, this happened because of many people being involved, when, you know, my own mind says, like, I, this all comes down to me. I have to, whatever, <laughs> cook all this stuff, do all these things. And it's like, that's not true. Yeah. That's, that's never been the basis of, of any festival. Well, I mean, the exception of God creating everything and resting, I suppose. Because you can't, yeah, you can't really have a party by yourself. No, it's not that fun. And, uh, and, and I think that when we have all that in mind and we remember that we're doing this as, as community and we're, we're playing our role and that the acceptance of that gift and the rejoicing in it and the gratitude for it is part of it. And, and Paul actually was really on, on to something there. So, you know, Joy uh, does all this work in preparing uh, invitations and arrangements and bringing up tables and Polly's doing all this work and somebody shows up and just finds it and it's like oh well this is cool and these are really yummy and this is a nice person what's going on here you're doing leisure and they're doing leisure and hopefully you know in about six months you guys can tag and <laughs> just and uh that's that's when things are working just right and perfectly in tune and we're not always there, right? Uh, but like you said, it's the hardest part is finding people who will enjoy it and accept it. And that's why, yeah, is writing the Christmas sermon and the Easter sermon, is that work? Yeah, it's work, but it it's something that I just, I cannot help but delight in. So when I, when I agonize over those days particularly, it's not a sad kind of a thing or a reluctance in any way. It's, I mean, I'm enjoying it because I know who's going to be there. And I know that there are going to be some people I didn't, I didn't expect to. And, uh, and that's, that's part, it's all baked together. So next week we'll start on a downer. This week, I hope we kind of went up. Next week, it's going to start uh, a little bit in the basement as we talk about academia and aesthetics. But it's actually good because we got a lot of time. So, all right, well, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of leisure. By your Holy Spirit, grant that we would use it well to the glory of your name and growth in your kingdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.